Dennis and I were sprawled out on the uncomfortable, prickly mess Jason tried to pass off as carpet. Our backs pressed into what felt like Colossus toothbrush bristles. But that sticky October evening, we couldn't have cared less. The taste of summer lingering in the back of our throats, like the aftertaste of charcoal-filtered vodka and orange juice screwdrivers we'd been mixing in our mouths since the second we showed up at Jason's attempt at a party, but was nothing more than an extraordinary collection of loud-mouthed small-town kids lounging around with personalities as predictable as the black eyeliner, teased hair, Bauhaus t-shirt formula they shared for looking dark and mysterious. Only, since that was supposed to be a special event, they were trying their damnedest, sporting shopping mall replicas of thrift store clothes crammed into Jason's $165 a month attic apartment, chain-smoking clove cigarettes and trying to hide when I coughed, speaking in bogus British accents, as if that hide their boring American backgrounds based on beef jerky, bong hits, and microwave burritos. To entertain ourselves, Stannis and I created a drinking game in which we took shots each time we heard a reference to Anne Rice novels, graveyards, tragic childhoods, or the expressions killer and intense. So it should come as no surprise we were sloshed and obnoxious, laughing and taking bites from the exceedingly soggy slice of tragically hip and misunderstood as they fought for attention, any sense of importance, but then I saw him standing in the corner dark hair around his shoulders onto the wall and messy strands graffiti tickling gaunt faces of models perfect and magazine glossy he in inhaled a short forever from his cigarette and smiled at me with dark eyes narrowed into slits i felt myself ignite like the marlboro cherry dangling from the end of his lips once i realized he was watching us watching them. His jaw cocksure and randy, snicker curled in the corners of his mouth as if he was in on a big secret, which actually he was, cause like the expression goes, you can't bullshit a bullshitter. I'd heard it from Stannis at least a million times, so when he whispered, uh-uh, red flag, stay the hell away, that made Michael all the more desirable. He stepped across the room and stepped into my life, stepped all over obligatory small talk about how he'd seen me around, or he thought I looked pretty cool, or had I ever heard of the band? Instead, I got to know him through the stories he told about his fetish for breaking into rich people's homes, hanging out, kicking back with big screen TVs and expensive wines till the police or security service would show. Then he'd hide in a closet, behind a tapestry, beneath a bed, listen to him boast about restoring order and all their shit, which usually was as cute to zap him with his cattle prod stun gun. None of that handheld miniature bit. He owned a magic wand that could clean a room with a flick of a wrist. He never stole a thing without a couple of uniforms flopping around on the floor in shock spasms, because that's what made it fun. Just like when he was wired on cheap Hell's Angels crank and snagged somebody's Alfa Romeo just so he could take it apart and scatter pieces all over Little Rock. He thought it'd make a great insurance report. He made life sound like a game he rewrote as he whisked across its board in a whirlwind, surviving alone, spinning smack dab in the eye of independence. He seemed sexy and streetwise and tough without sounding stupid, which excited me so greatly I could barely contain myself. We bailed Jason's sinking ship of a social event and headed back to my place, where we marked the start of our deep and meaningful Gen X post-John Hughes apocalyptic romance. Santa sort of disappeared from the scenery that three-week stretch. I didn't have time to hang out with them when I was busy smuggling bananas, boxes of cereal, and anything else from the cafeteria I could find to keep Michael from starving. I'd sit around and wait. When he'd slither late night 
through my dorm window and scale the wall without a simple goodbye, it struck me as strange and poetic in a very 90s way, as I wondered if I'd ever see him again. If he'd get shot in a fight with some gang, OD on some Mackey's court off the street, get thrown in jail to rot. By the time he'd saunter back to my room, my stomach and nerves were crushed up like aluminum cans, which usually kept me from class, but as soon as I saw him, I did my best to act nonchalant, recycle a sigh of relief with his steel kiss, remind myself he probably knows no other way. Must have known nothing else in the past, he told me next to nothing about. I was sure it was hell, though. Somebody must have loved him at some point. At that time, I thought I did, which is why once I stepped with him into the night, white tattered t-shirt in his back, a beacon that led me over fences, through alleys, around playgrounds, backyard pools. I tagged along the trail he tore just tight enough he didn't notice me behind. Pad in my pocket, in case I needed notes about his secret ways of crime. I was starving for excitement, so hungry for a bite, strands of saliva hung from my mouth, but at trail's end was no pot of gold but a stucco home, the color of dried tuna. A front door, Michael opened by a key rather than a screwdriver or stolen credit card. Floodlights and a constellation which came to life. When I head towards the window, tried to peek through its slats, I was lit on display on the well-trimmed grass, framed for Michael's mother, a chubby lady who popped outside like some sort of parent in a box. A blaze of fuzzy blue nightgown fury, her face contorted in disgust as she screamed about how I should be ashamed poking around on their private property. She'd had enough snotty-nosed brats, ill-bred punk rockers and Democrats like me, being bad influences on her sweet little Mikey, keeping him out to god-awful hours of the a.m. and causing him to get bad marks at school and detention. Just what was I trying to prove anyway, bullying her sweet baby? I stood speechless. The situation making no sense till I found out he was 17. I didn't know what to say, so I watched the sweat shine on her face. Mounds of flesh which shook as she rambled, flapped as she screeched, her mouth an opened map to a world of PTA meetings, bologna sandwiches, gospel choirs, and country crafts, as common to him as to me. That reckless little wannabe street smart daredevil, he slid into my life like a soft whisper, but faded to a dull outline, a stretched out shadow lingering inside his mother's home. He watched her bring the truth to life. Watched her, watching me, smile. About the things I learned he wasn't. Mysterious, powerful, mean. And as I turned and walked away, grinning wider still, I loved him most for what he was. A scared boy trying to hide behind a leather jacket and look tough. He never came around again. I haven't seen him since. Still, some nights, thoughts of him keep me awake. The times we shared within a slot when neither of us was sure of much of anything. Wrapped tight in college. The world of make-believe. Just as it starts to feel real to me again, suddenly, it's morning. And I wake to milky bright sunlight gushing through the window. Waves from my loud alarm clock rippling throughout my bare apartment. No furnishings of Michael, Stannis. No traces of Jason to be found. The only things to push away or clutch. A wad of cold sheets on my bed.